everybody. Uh, thank you, Brandon. Appreciate it. Um, and uh, really excited to be able to introduce, introduce this session. My name is Sean Priest. I am the principal at Sequoia High School, for those of you who don't know me. Um, three years ago, when Dr. Rio spoke to Sequoia students in a packed Carrington Hall, he established a connection with our students and our community, which to this day remains strong. Um, I can still hear the applause when he began his talk that day, and I can hear them even louder, <clears throat> along with feet stomping and laudatory yelling when he finished his talk. Um, his personal story and his message are inspiring, as you will hear today. I want to acknowledge uh, Sequoia teachers, Carlos Navarrete and Evelyn Valencia, who have nurtured our relationship with Dr. Rios at Sequoia over the years. I think they're both on this call. Dr. Victor Rios was born in Mexico. He immigrated to Oakland with his mother when he was two years old, growing up in a single parent household. Uh, Mr. Rios, Dr. Rios lived in several Oakland neighborhoods during his youth, West Oakland, Fruitvale, Elmhurst. He grew up in some of the poorest neighborhoods in the East Bay. Growing up around drug dealers and gangs, he was forced to join a local Latino East Oakland gang when he was 12 years old for protection. And being part of a gang brought him to a life of crime, stealing cars, uh, sometimes living in them, selling drugs, getting into fights, going in and out of juvenile detention. When Dr. Rios was 15, he and one of his best friends uh, named Smiley, uh, Smiley was shot and killed um, in Fruitvale by a rival gang, literally died in Dr. Rios' arms. And it was around this time that a teacher whom Dr. Rios called Mrs. Russ began helping and mentoring him. An Oakland police officer also gave him a break from catching a major case with severe charges. From there, Dr. Rios began changing his life from gang member to college student, enrolling at UC Berkeley, and eventually earning a PhD in sociology. He began mentoring Oakland youth and working with them to get them out of the life of crime and into college. Dr. Rios has written two books, one of which is about growing up in Oakland uh, called Street Life, Poverty Gangs and a PhD. The second book he wrote was a study on Oakland black and, youth, and Latino youth and how the local justice system and school system systematically sets up kids for a life of punishment and incarceration instead of getting out of that lifestyle. This book is called Punished, Policing the Lives of Black and Latino Youth. Today, Dr. Rios is a professor at UC Santa Barbara, and he still works with at-risk youth in the Santa Barbara area and here in Redwood City. So perhaps more inspiring to me than this story is the way that Dr. Rios has remained a part of our students' lives after that day where he blew us all away in Carrington Hall. Participants in Sequoia's Team Ascent program read Street Life each summer, and each summer, Dr. Rios makes a point to reach out personally to them, either in, uh, in person or uh, this summer, for example, via a recorded message. He's offered to get on Zoom with students and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. And the way that students respond to Dr. Rios' work, I think, affirms my deep belief that every student wants to be successful in their education. Every student wants to be successful in learning. Every human wants to be successful in learning part of why we do what we do. It's our duty as educators to remove and neutralize the impediments that hold our fellow human beings back from being successful in their learning. So I have seen firsthand how Dr. Rios has awakened this desire in countless students over the years through his book, but also in the way that he talks to them. Um, I have uh, pictures and videos and notes from students to show you just how Dr. Rios walks this talk um, I'd love to show them to you, but I'm also going to get out of the way and let him talk. So with that said, it is my deep, deep honor to introduce Dr. Victor Rios here today uh, as part of this very important day uh, of this week in our district's 2020 professional development series. Dr. Rios, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, hey, Mr. Priest. I mean, I, I just can't believe it that three years later you have that uh, memory. Uh, it's an honor. I'm flattered. Thank you so much. Hello, educators. Good morning, buenos dias. I'm very honored to be here. Um, you know, we've evolved. Uh, there's a twin pandemic, and the twin pandemic is COVID-19, and uh, the second pandemic is global racism. So as humanity, we've evolved. We, we've learned how to be safe against COVID. Um, we've learned to wear masks for some of us. We've learned to uh, distance ourselves by, by social distancing uh, should not be social isolation for our students. So I'll say it again, social distancing should not equal social isolation for our students. But we've learned to be socially distant. Now we have to learn not to be socially isolated. 
right? And that's going to be one of the big tasks I have as an educator uh, coming into the academic year. How do I make sure that my students are not socially isolated? And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So we've learned all these things as humanity. And then the other pandemic, the global racist pandemic, we've also learned to evolve. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, just eight months ago, educators would uh, contact me, education leaders, they would say, hey, Dr. Rios, will you talk about equity? Two years before that, they would call me in, they'd say, hey, Dr. Rios, will you talk about diversity? Now, education leaders are calling me saying, will you talk about anti-racism, right? So we've, we've evolved our, our knowledge and vocabulary, um, but it also means we should uh, evolve our practices. Right, so today I'm gonna to just give you some ideas and practices on how to be that anti-racist educator in a community, um, a lot of wonderful diversity, uh, but also students that are in need of healing and need of support. So before I continue, I'll show you a short uh, video clip of uh, my story here. Maybe. It looks like my slides are a little frozen, so uh, I'll, I'll wait a second and see if they unfreeze. But uh, in terms, here we go. Here we go. Hopefully this works. Oh, maybe not. I apologize. Um, so in, in terms of, uh, being an anti-race uh, educator, one of the important factors to consider is um, the emotional support that you provide to your students, right? To be uh, anti-racist is to understand how within each population that has been differently, there might be, there might be different ways of feeling the education system. So I'll say it again, that with, within different populations that have been racialized differently, there's different ways of feeling the education system. I'll give you an example. For say an African-American family um, who may be uh, with the history of education in our country, um, there and, and this family might be low income, uh, that parents of the children that are going to school uh, may be a little bit disillusioned by the education system because maybe they were pushed out by education system. And so when parents are sending their kids to school, there's very little trust because already the education system has failed them as one generation. And now maybe their, their children are being set up to be failed by the system. So the legitimacy of our education system is is compromised for racialized populations that's what i mean by how we feel differently based on race even though you know race is not real in the sense that you can't just generalize that one group experiences everything the same at the same time there's patterns in our society that show that certain groups uh get it differently so for example in california most uh In California, most of the population uh, is uh, uh, that is disciplined, that is kicked out of school, right? Disproportionately is African American, uh, and then followed by Latino, and then followed by some Southeast Asian populations and some Pacific Islander populations, right? That these populations are disproportionately affected by school discipline. Uh, maybe that means that they're seen as troublemakers more than other groups, and that means that then racialized differently. So to be an anti-racist educator is to acknowledge the different ways in which populations are racialized, and to just name it, to name race. You know, If you're a white teacher, just name it. If you're a teacher that doesn't have experience connecting with other students, regardless of your race, uh, naming that, this is a population I need to learn more about. 
That's step one. Okay, let me check to see if we're able to play these slides now, okay? Okay, well, I'm going to apologize again, and I'm just going to skip over one last desperate effort, and then I'll skip over this slide if it doesn't work. It's not working, so I'm just going to skip over and uh, continue the conversation without these slides. Um, and so uh, the next the next step, but see, I always, I have to have here we go, I have to have a plan B, okay? So here's the next step. Okay, so an educator has the power of providing uh, opportunities, of providing uh, another chance at a, a, a second uh, lifetime. And what I mean by a second lifetime is that sometimes for some of our students that we serve, even though they're young, 13, 14, uh, sometimes younger than that, right, that, that uh, for some of them, uh, they, by this age, they've already lived an entire lifetime. And so what I mean by that is that uh, for, for these students, for these children, uh, they've had to grow up fast. They've had to um, endure having to raise their, their siblings, even though they're little. They've had to fend for themselves. They've had to figure out how to make a living in a place where rent is super, super high. Uh, where living expenses are really high. And so when the students log into your classes, right, uh, maybe the last thing on their mind is academics, right? Take my brother, he was seven years old. I was three years old. And uh, my mom would leave to go to work and she would lock the door from the outside. And my brother for 10 hours had to watch watch me, entertain me, make sure I was fed, and make sure I did not fall out of that second story uh, window. So um, for a seven-year-old that's trying to show up to school, his last priority is academics. His first priority is that very basic lower bottom of Haslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, right? That just We just need to figure out our basic uh, meals, our shelter, how are we going to make it? As educators, we're kind of up here on that pyramid. We want to, we want to provide students an opportunity to reach self-actualization. And sometimes we jump the gun, if you will, in that we're focused on the academics while our students are focused on the survival. So how do we meet them kind of halfway, right? We have to teach them. We have to teach them. We have to uh, provide academics. But in order to teach me, right, in order to teach me, first you have to reach me. Right? In order to teach me, first you have to reach me. So an anti-racist educator is able to transform lives because they understand every population, but they understand the various students and where they're coming from and, and more importantly, they understand how to reflect on learning about new populations they might not uh, know about. So my own journey begins when I'm really little. I didn't have a dad. I crossed the border with my mother and my brother through the desert. Uh, we made it to Oakland, California, uh, living in poverty. And uh, we end up in this messed up environment with violence and drugs. And I'm growing up in this environment and in eighth grade, um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much struggling. My little cousin, he's my neighbor. He's two months old. Uh, he's sleeping in his crib. And one night we had big rats and those rats crawled up his crib and they began to chew his face up. They chewed his lips, his gums, his cheeks. By the time that his mom uh, turns on the lights, um, this baby is in a 
in a pool of, of blood. And at this moment, you know, I'm in eighth grade and I'm thinking, I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to be poor. So I decided in eighth grade to drop out of school for the first time. Uh, and I ended up pushing lawnmowers. That didn't work for me. It wasn't paying the bills. So I ended up on the streets, stealing cars. I ended up in juvie. I come in and out of juvie and I didn't care. It was three felonies for stealing cars and I still did not care. On my third time out from juvie, I'm on the streets with my best friend and we get in a fight with a group of our enemies and that's when uh, he ends up shot. And uh, he passes away and I didn't know who to turn to. I didn't know where to go. Uh, I didn't feel like there was any adult in my life that would be there for me. But I went to the one place where one person had told me that she would be there for me if I was ready to change. I went to school to find my teacher. <laughs> my teacher, uh, her name was Miss Russ. And Miss Russ was the kind of teacher that was always in your business. She was the kind of teacher that was always looking out for you. She was the kind of teacher that even if you had her upset, maybe cussed at her, she would always have a smile on her face. You know, she would be patient. One day she kicked me out of class for cussing at her. And as I'm leaving the class, she says, Vic, I'm going to be here for you. When she kicked me out of class, I thought she was going to tell me what other teachers had told me. Uh, I thought she was going to say, um, don't let the doorknob hit you on the, you know what, on the way out. But indeed, what she said was, I'll give you a second chance. And I remember that moment. So I'm um, walking down the hallway. I get back to school after my best friend gets killed. And she comes out, she knows what happened. So she's checking up on me, asking me if I'm okay. And I'm trying to be a tough guy. Uh, so I tell her I'm fine. She taps me on the shoulder. And right when this teacher tapped me on my shoulder, all my pain, all my fear, all my anger began to grow. And I began to cry like a little kid in front of the whole school. You know what this teacher did? She opened her arms, she gave me a hug. She said, Victor, I'm here for you. If you're ready to change your life around, I'll be here for you, but you have to do work. So I thought about what my teacher told me. I go back to school. I start catching up with my credits and I start doing better. But one thing that stuck with me was the label that the school had given me and the label that other educators had given me. You see, Ms. Russ saw me as someone with potential, but um, other educators did not. Uh, so she had to convince them, right, that I was someone that had potential. And so there is a moment in my story where um, this appears on national TV. Uh, it's a PBS frontline documentary on my school. And I happened to be in a scene where a police officer is dragging me away from being in a gang fight. So in this image here, I'm the person with the white t-shirt walking towards these guys that are wearing red over there. And uh, there's a fight scene. And then uh, we get pulled away by the cop. The cop pulls me away and I end up getting expelled from school. So um, as I'm expelled from school and trying to fight it and get back into school. My teacher's trying to convince other educators that I'm not a risk, that I have potential. And at that point, one teacher asks her, what kind of potential, potential, potential for what, to do what? In other words, um, these kids don't have any potential, right? And so my teacher, argues with this other teacher uh, and she says potential to make it potential for further education and it, again this is aired on national tv as part of this documentary 
And I'm kind of in the middle of being labeled, right, through a deficit perspective as this gang member that has no potential, that's getting kicked out of school. And 20 years later, right, this teacher, Miss Russ, that believed that I could make it, ends up having her last laugh because she ends up uh, being able to prove that if you put your heart into students, even if they're caught up in this crazy uh, background and, and being uh, victims of their environment, that they could make it, right? But it has to have uh, uh, a perspective that's beyond the deficit model. So we have to flip the deficit model. That's important uh, as educators. And I'll give some examples in a minute here. So after I start to uh, change my life around, uh, I start to uh, reflect on what would it, it would mean for me to uh, go to college, what it would mean for me to start working with young people like those uh, in this image. And I start to think about how my teacher, you know, 20 plus years ago, saw kids like me and kids like this on the screen as having potential, as having promise. So here you see a group of kids, it's a school day. This 14 year old has a gin bottle in his hand. And of course, as, as schools, as society, we might see them as having risk, as being at risk. But that in itself, the deficit perspective, right? And I'm just gonna say it, right? That a deficit perspective is a racist perspective when it comes to labeling kids of color, right? That when you create a label or perpetuate a label that is negative, that is deficit, you're perpetuating racism. So this idea of risk labels individuals and they could never really break that label unless they get a lot of support and help to break it. So instead of risk, I, well, I propose that we create uh, other terms, in this case, at promise. And finally, actually last year uh, in April, uh, Governor Newsom, after some uh, legislation signed into, into law, that in education code, we no longer use the word at risk. It's, it's the at promise bill, that's what it's known as. But it took 20 years of advocacy. And then prior to that, there were teachers like Ms. Russ, like my teacher, trying to change the way we label kids. So I want you to think about, I'm going to take a little pause here, and I want you to think about ways in which, um, you know, uh, there's other deficit labels uh, for students in, in, in your experience. What are other um, labels that are deficit-based uh, that are out there? And I'll check the comments. I'm going to take a quick little break here. So if you can, in the comments, just uh, put in there what labels are out there uh, that are deficit beyond at risk what are some other labels used on students all right i'll check the comments real quick here all right so here we go look at this incredible before i even ask ventura epaa Dr. Rio, sorry for interrupting. I was labeled at risk and I graduated from Stanford. Congratulations to you. I'm here to be a teacher I never had to my students. Wow. Thank you so much for, for, for this. Lazy is another deficit. Uh, achievement gap instead of opportunity gap. Low achieving. Uh, subgroup. Defiant. High risk. Underperformant. Oh, wow, people, Carol Ann uh, Coleman, people still use the word retarded. That's not good. Uh, not it. Parents are not educated, deficit language. Uh, Eng English learner versus multilingual. Uh, yeah, underrepresented, lower, lower achieving, special ed, you know, uh, let's rethink that, you know. Um, not applying himself. <laughs> Daphne's just going to say it. Daphne just said it. Okay, Sia McCann, she said, hey, 
assholes. Some people have called kids assholes. <laughs> let me just <laughs> let me just say something about that, okay? Um, you cannot stoop to the developmental level of your student. You're the adult, right? So please do not stoop to the developmental level of your student. I'm sure that student has called you names. That does not mean that then you have the right to call them names and then go behind their backs and around, around your colleagues call them names. Because okay? now you're developmentally diminished, right? You've, you've put yourself in a 16-year-old developmental stage. And what we've learned through the brain research is that the part of the brain responsible for reasoning, the frontal lobe, doesn't even fully develop until we're 21, 22 years old. I know that for some of you, you're saying, wait a minute, Dr. Rios, uh, for some of my colleagues, that part of the brain never fully <laughs> developed. But uh, you know what I'm talking about, that, that most of us adults can reason in ways that even 19-year-olds can't. You don't believe it? Go back to your college days. Go back to your freshman, sophomore year. I've got my students out here in Santa Barbara that are you know, gathering in groups of 30, uh, even though they're not supposed to. What's going on with them? Are they stupid? Are they assholes? No, they are going through developmental maturity that they're not at our level. You know, we got masks on, we're away from people, most of us, um, unless we're ideologues and have something else going on. But most adults, right, uh, at least in some regions, are following protocol, whereas 19, 20 years are not. It's because developmentally, they're not there yet. And yet many educators will stoop to that developmental level, thinking that that's the way that's going to solve the problem. And it's not. Okay. So thank you. Wow. Minorities. Yes. Minorities means minor. It means less than. Uh, look at this. Ungrateful thugs, gang members. Wow. Look at this. You got, you got colored color orders. Hmm. Um, Pandero, chavos, mafiosos, marihuanos. Yeah, even in the Latinx community, we have ways of having a deficit language for our own uh, kids, right? Because the system kind of teaches us that our kids are uh, wrongdoers, and then we we internalize it. Okay, thank you so much. I, it was good to see the chat here. I appreciate it. So now, you know, uh, uh, the the goal then is to humanize our students and our families, right? To humanize our students and our families. And I wanna share a quote from Ms. Russ. She says, hey, I don't teach subjects, I teach students. I don't teach subjects, I teach students. Um, even though she was a computer teacher, right? That her first goal was to first um, serve us as human beings, as, as students, right? Not as subjects, that's an object, a subject that's something external to the human but she's serving what's internal human right the heart the soul the ability to prosper and a lot of times especially in stem as educators in stem you might say look this is not for for this for the stem arena because social emotional learning could be covered in like stories that get told in an English class, but how can I do it in math? And my response is always, well, let's walk through a, a few modules where we show in one study in middle school, I was able to test to see teachers that spent 12 minutes on SEL activities, like getting to know their kids, um, team building, having the kids um, move around. And now through virtual learning, uh, connecting with them in, in ways where they're also moving around. They're also uh, simple getting to know you activities and simple expressing emotion activities like one that we do now on remote learning is uh, is simple. It's a rose and a thorn. What was your rose for the week? Something good to happen. What was your thorn? It takes a while, right? It could take up to 15 minutes to do sometimes. And sometimes you rotate who you ask. And then there's a 25 minute lesson in math, 
Now that shrank the amount of time it reduced drastically of how much time you could do to teach math by at least 15 minutes. So then the other class gets 40 minutes of math and then we go and we check the math test score soon after and we find that there's a small increase in test scores for the kids that got less math but more SEL. I'll say it again, that in one of our pilot studies, the kids that got less math, more SEL were able to catch, capture, internalize more of the math lesson, even though it was shorter than the kids that got the full 40 minutes of math. And that's a powerful thing because it's showing that it's not so much about the quantity in this case of math, but the quality, right? The quality human connection and then teaching the academic piece. Okay, so we humanize our students and their families on a day-to-day -day basis. So in these um, languages that you see on your screen here come up and teachers, your colleagues start to use them, you just, you know, remind them. We're humanizing our families. That's what we're doing. Uh, we we're not talking deficit about our families. You know, um, if it's uh, a conversation about how families are not there, they're absent. I mean, a fact is a fact, right? If they're There's a family that's not, not there. Oh, this family, this is a fact. The family's not there. What can we do to support uh, this child? So because of someone like you, an educator, I found a key. So I want you to tell me also in the comments, what key do you think uh, my teacher helped me find with her support and with her sending me off? Eventually, she sent me off to college. What key do you think my teacher helped me find? And as you type that love, trust, yes, the key to potential, hope, believing in yourself, to have worth and value, confidence that I'm valuable, empathy to believe in myself, encouragement and confidence, a different life, a door to greatness, support, authentic caring. Wow, look at that. That's actually from the education, Ventura. I, I see you. I see you reading the literature, the research in education, a vision for self. Unconditional positive regard. Wow. I'm about to introduce the concept like here in a minute. Self-love, acknowledgement of home language, belief in you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what my, uh, what key, uh, my teacher. provided me uh, with her unconditional system because she confronted teachers like that where uh, let's see a trailer where um, uh, the pushouts.com where she's having this debate it's from a, a newer documentary where she's having this debate with the teacher back then back then and and that's where uh, he says So we have to be success of students of color as central to our own teaching success. And again, we're naming it, right? We can't be colorblind. We can't be like, oh, I just teach all students. I don't see color. And, uh, you know, I teach them equally because what happens. Um, oh, I, I thank you for telling me about the freezing. I'll, I'll repeat some of what I'm saying because I think folks are seeing a little bit of freezing here. Uh, uh, so thank you for telling me. I appreciate the comments. I'm reading them, and I'll I'll repeat the points I'm making because I I'm, I'm seeing a little bit lag in the system. But thanks for telling me. Keep telling me if you're having a hard time, and I'll make sure to repeat. So, um, what really is important is to embrace a perspective that names 
race that's that acknowledges race and says, look, you know, maybe I'm the same as these students. Maybe I'm different. Maybe as I'm the same as some of my students, but not others. How can I uh, bridge that gap between me and them, right? And, and that's what it means to be an anti-racist educator, that we acknowledge uh, the ra- the, what's going on with our students. Okay, so um, I just got a message. You can't see my screen. Is that, is that Brendan? Do you do a thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs up, do you see my screen, Brendan? Yeah, you see it. Okay, okay, good. All right, thank you all for your feedback. Okay, thank you. So, um, but all to say that uh, when you provide students an opportunity based on their background, based on how they've been racialized in our society and acknowledge that. Like another thing my teacher would do is she knew she was white, right? You saw her picture. <laughs> and, um, and she knew I was a brown student. So what did she do? She acknowledged it. She named it. She said, look, Victor, I know you probably feel like you can't relate to me sometimes. And I was just trying to be polite. So I was like, yeah. And she went to the university, to UC Berkeley down the street, and she brought some Mexican-American Chicano students to come and mentor me. And they were the ones that helped me apply to college. Um, And then they were the ones that helped me uh, really uh, get uh, situated uh, for opportunity. I'm going to turn my video off for a little bit, folks, but you'll hear my audio, okay? And then maybe that'll fix some of the glitching for it. I'll try it for a few minutes. Okay. So thumbs up if you can hear me. Thumbs up. Brandon, thumbs up. Okay, good, good. I'll be back on that screen. I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, you're able to at the very least hear my presentation. Okay, so uh, I go on to apply to college. I graduate from college uh, with this encouragement from my teacher, and then I end up uh, going to UC Berkeley uh, to get a PhD. It took four and a half years. It was a lot of hard work, but with the support of my mentors and still being in contact with my teacher, I ended up graduating. In the year 2005, I became uh, Dr. Victor Rios. And so the key that my teacher gave me was this key to opportunity. I uh, eventually, uh, I actually graduated Sunday, um, uh, a Sunday from UC Berkeley. On a Monday, I'm at the bank asking for a home loan. So I get to the bank, I ask for a home loan. I couldn't believe that they actually gave me a home loan. I go, I buy a house. Uh, and uh, I come back uh, a few weeks later, or a couple months. I don't remember exactly how long, but I had a key. I put the key in my pocket. I go to my mom's uh, apartment. I get to her apartment. I knock on her door. And for some of you, you're, you're um, able to see the picture of my mother there. And she uh, ends up. She ends up, uh, you know, opening the door. I give her the key, and she says, uh, "You know, I said to her, you know, Mom, I'm sorry you had to wait 30 years for this, but here is uh, the key uh, to a proper place to live." So again, educators, it's very crucial to uh, think about the way in which uh, sometimes you know you have the power or oftentimes you have the power to transform lives that's an that as an educator you are able to uh, make a difference in the life of students in ways that not many other people can that what happens is that our students are often left behind by many systems, right? Including a system of inequality, class inequality, race inequality, gender inequality. And they come into you, um, into your classroom, into your education system, uh, wanting support, craving support. And, um, and that's what we need to bring to them. 
The other component uh, that we use in being an anti-racist educator is to use data to reflect on race and racism, right? We're, and, and by data, I do mean studies, but I also just mean you collecting, uh, being aware, like how is this system, right, that we're trying to teach on and learn on being inequitable to our students? Like even now, right, I'm trying to give you a presentation. I have the best bandwidth, the best computer, the best setup, the best everything. And I'm still, you know, racing to make sure I get the message across to you. So imagine what happens with our students when we're trying to teach them and this starts to happen with them. They're like, I want to give up. I don't, you know, I'm not learning anything here. Things are glitching. How do we, you know, how do we connect with them when we're on systems that may that may not even uh, work for them, right? So that's that's important to think about that there's got to be different ways in which we deliver content, right? So here we go. All right, let me try one last time. I'm going to try one last time to share my screen. And if that doesn't work, then we'll just conclude the presentation with... Uh, with me talking. Luckily, I have these backdrops as well to, to help us out. All right. So one last time, folks, thank you for your patience. Here we go. Okay. Uh, let's see. Brandon, you're giving me thumbs up. You can see uh, my teacher and I here project the self-actualization, Brandon. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, all right. I think it work, it's working. Uh, thank you all for your patience. So look, I'm gonna leave you with this concept here, all right? And this concept, educator projected self-actualization, is this idea that uh, as educators, we are able to project for our students a future that they have not even begun to imagine. I'll say it again, that as educators, we're able to project for our students a future that they have not even begun to imagine. So think of yourself, right, like a PowerPoint projector, you know, like you're projecting for them a better life, a better future, and a, and a better society, right? Because after all, they're leaders in our communities that will make this world a better place. So I'll give you an example. On the left side of the screen is the person that my teacher met, but she always saw me as the person on the right, this professional. How can that be? How can the teacher see me 20 years from now? And she predict I was going to make it? Well, I'll just let you know. Educators cannot predict a student's future, but they can project a better future for them. I'll say it again. Educators cannot predict a student's future, but they can project a better future for them. And so, uh, as an example, is her just always giving me positive, affirmative messages. Uh, one very concrete example is when she says, Victor, I'm proud of you. Uh, you're going to college, and I know one day you, you will meet presidents. And I was like, Miss Russ, you're crazy. <laughs> 20 years later, uh, after writing one of my books, Punished, Policing the Lives of Black and Latino Boys, I get invited to the Obama White House to advise the administration on violence and policing. Brandon, can you see the screen at all? Yeah, you see a sign? Great, thank you. And um, so I uh, get to the Obama uh, White House and uh, I was nervous. This kid from the streets of Oakland. And uh, they, hey, look at this, Stephen Stephen uh, saying, hey, he's been teaching 25 years was a former OPD he just messaged me over here he wants to know if he was one of the officers that uh, into me 
were you part of the writers? Do you remember the writers? They used to beat up inner city kids and lock them up. They grabbed my younger brother and them outside of the vehicle he was in, slammed his face on the ground. I'm joking, Steven. I don't think you were a writer, but they were corrupt police officers. Anyway, long story. <laughs> I know that Steven's saying that was long after you left. But long story short, is I go advise the Obama administration on gun violence and police, but I couldn't believe this kid from Oakland is at the White House at the Eisenhower building talking to the Obama administration. And eventually I even got to meet President Obama and uh, got invited to this little gathering in front of the White House lawn. Um, and I don't know about where you come from, but where I come from, if you get one ticket for one person to go to an event, I'll bring in my whole family. So I brought my daughter, my other daughter, my son, my wife, and some random friend that lived in DC at the time. We go to the White House, we're on the lawn. There's my son, he's, you know, uh, uh, enjoying himself. There's a bunch of Congress people there. And all of a sudden, President Obama comes out and uh, we get to meet him. And he comes up to me and my son. He's shaking people's hands, shakes my hand, looks at my son. My son was uh, uh, sitting on my shoulders. And he says to my son, give me five. Don't leave me hanging. <laughs> and in that moment, I could not believe myself. Uh, my son and Obama's hands touched and all I kept thinking about was, Miss Russ, <laughs> you really are, you really are crazy. She projected for me a future that I could not even begin to imagine. And here I am thinking about my teacher who believed in me so much that I was able to fulfill that belief. That's a powerful thing to be, right? An educator that can help fulfill a future but you have to believe you can't judge all these students. You can't, you just can't judge anyone. You have to just say, they all have potential. They're all gonna make it. I'm gonna put in equal distribution of love and labor into every student. And when you do that, your chances of them succeeding increase. All right, the good year. I even went to Vice President Joe Biden's house. I went to the, <laughs> I went to the bathroom at his house. <laughs> And look, at, I brought some of these little uh, napkins home as a, as a souvenir, you know. Hey, you can take, you take me out of Oakland, but you can't take Oakland out of me. <laughs> all right, all right, I'll continue here.